Lesson six. I will arise. Sabbath afternoon, February three. The Lord is soon to come in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Is there not enough comprehended in the truths which cluster round this event and in the preparation essential for it to make us think solemnly of our duty? Distinctly and clearly, this subject is to be kept before the people. The Son of Man shall come in his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations. Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 and 32. The final judgment is a most solemn, awful event. This must take place before the universe. To the Lord Jesus, the Father has committed all judgment. He will declare the reward of loyalty to the law of Jehovah. God will be honored and his government vindicated and glorified, and that in the presence of the inhabitants of the unfallen worlds. On the largest possible scale will the government of God be vindicated and exalted. It is not the judgment of one individual or of one nation, but of the whole world. Oh, what a change will then be made in the understanding of all created beings. Then all will see the value of eternal life. This Day with God, page 296. The pure religion of Jesus is the fountain from which flow streams of charity, love, self-sacrifice. A Christian is a Christ-like man, a Christ-like woman, who is active in God's service, who is present at the social meeting, whose presence will encourage others also. Religion does not consist in works, but religion works. It is not dormant. Many seem to feel that religion has a tendency to make its possessor narrow and cramped, but genuine religion does not have a narrowing influence. It is the lack of religion that cramps the faculties and narrows the mind. When a man is narrow, it is an evidence that he needs the grace of God, the heavenly anointing. For a Christian is one whom the Lord, the God of hosts, can work through, that he may keep the ways of the Lord of the earth and make manifest his will to men. Ellen G. White comments in the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 7, page 935. There is joy and consolation for the true-hearted, faithful Christian that the world knows not of. To them, it is a mystery. The Christian's hope is big with immortality and full of glory. It reacheth to that within the veil, and is an anchor to the soul, both sure and steadfast. And when the storm of God's wrath shall come upon the ungodly, this hope will not fail them, but they are hid as in the secret of his pavilion. Though the earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard and be removed like a cottage, if we have made God our trust, he will deliver us. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation, there shall no evil befall thee. Sons and Daughters of God, page 354. Sunday, February 4. The Majestic Warrior. Fallen man is Satan's lawful captive. The mission of Christ was to rescue him from the power of his great adversary. Man is naturally inclined to follow Satan's suggestions, and he cannot successfully resist so terrible a foe unless Christ, the mighty conqueror, dwells in him, guiding his desires and giving him strength. God alone can limit the power of Satan. Satan knows better than God's people the power that they can have over him when their strength is in Christ. When they humbly entreat the mighty conqueror for help, the weakest believer in the truth, relying firmly upon Christ, can successfully repulse Satan and all his host. Satan will call to his aid legions of his angels to oppose the advance of even one soul, and, if possible, wrest it from the hand of Christ. But if the one in danger perseveres, and in his helplessness casts himself upon the merits of the blood of Christ, our Savior listens to the earnest prayer of faith and sends a reinforcement of those angels that excel in strength to deliver him. 
Satan cannot endure to have his powerful rival appealed to, for he fears and trembles before his strength and majesty. At the sound of fervent prayer, Satan's whole host trembles. Our Father Cares, page 216. Through the power that Jesus gives, we can be more than conquerors, but we cannot manufacture this power. Only through the Spirit of God can we receive it. We need a deep insight into the nature of Christ and into the mystery of His love which passeth knowledge. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 19. We are to live in the warm, genial rays of the Son of Righteousness. Nothing but Christ's loving compassion, His divine grace, His almighty power can enable us to baffle the relentless foe and subdue the opposition of our own hearts. What is our strength? The joy of the Lord. Let the love of Christ fill our hearts, and then we shall be prepared to receive the power that He has for us. Let us thank God every day for the blessings that are ours. If the human agent will humble himself before God, realizing his utter inability to do the work that needs to be done in order that his soul may be purified, if he will cast away his own righteousness, Christ will abide in his heart. He will put his hand to the work of creating him anew and will continue the work till he is complete in him. In Heavenly Places, page 64. Monday, February 5. Justice for the Oppressed. Those who have pity for the unfortunate, the blind, the lame, the afflicted, the widows, the orphans, and the needy, Christ represents as commandment keepers who shall have eternal life. In view of what heaven is doing to save the lost, how can those who are partakers of the riches of the grace of Christ withdraw their interest and their sympathies from their fellow men? How can they indulge in pride of rank or caste and despise the unfortunate and the poor? Welfare Ministry, page 209. When a man is struggling with honest endeavor to sustain himself and his family and yet is unable to do this so that they suffer for necessary food and clothing, the Lord will not pronounce our ministering brethren guiltless if they look on with indifference or prescribe conditions for this brother which are virtually impossible of fulfillment. We are to make the condition of the unfortunate brother our own. Any neglect on the part of those who claim to be followers of Christ, a failure to relieve the necessities of a brother or a sister who is bearing the yoke of poverty and oppression, is registered in the books of heaven as shown to Christ in the person of his saints. What a reckoning the Lord will have with many, very many, who present the words of Christ to others but fail to manifest tender sympathy and regard for a brother in the faith who is less fortunate and successful than themselves. Welfare Ministry, page 210. How great was the gift of God to man, and how like our God to make it! With a liberality that can never be exceeded he gave, that he might save the rebellious sons of men and bring them to see his purpose and discern his love. Will you, by your gifts and offerings, show that you think nothing too good for him who gave his only begotten Son? The spirit of liberality is the spirit of heaven. The spirit of selfishness is the spirit of Satan. God is not dependent upon men for the advancement of his cause. He might have made angels the ambassadors of his truth. He might have made known his will as he proclaimed the law from Sinai with his own voice. But in order to cultivate a spirit of benevolence in us, he has chosen to employ men to do this work. Every act of self-sacrifice for the good of others will strengthen the spirit of beneficence in the giver's heart, allying him more closely to the Redeemer of the world, who was rich, yet for our sakes became poor, that we through his poverty might be rich. And it is only as we fulfill the divine purpose in our creation that life can be a blessing to us. All the good gifts of God to man will prove only a curse unless he employs them to bless his fellow men and for the advancement of God's cause in the earth. Councils on Stewardship, pages 19 and 20. Tuesday. 
Tuesday, February 6. How long will you judge unjustly? David knew that God's high purpose for Israel could be met only as rulers and people should seek with unceasing vigilance to attain to the standard placed before them. He knew that in order for his son Solomon to fulfill the trust with which God was pleased to honor him, the youthful ruler must be not merely a warrior, a statesman, and a sovereign, but a strong, good man, a teacher of righteousness, an example of fidelity. With tender earnestness, David entreated Solomon to be manly and noble, to show mercy and loving kindness to his subjects, and in all his dealings with the nations of earth, to honor and glorify the name of God and to make manifest the beauty of holiness. The many trying and remarkable experience through which David had passed during his lifetime had taught him the value of the nobler virtues and led him to declare in his dying charge to Solomon, He that ruleth over men must be just, ruling in the fear of God, and he shall be as the light of the morning when the sun riseth, even a morning without clouds, as the tender grass springing out of the earth by clear shining after rain. 2 Samuel, chapter 23, verses 3 and 4. Prophets and Kings, page 26. In his careful safeguarding of the rights and liberties of his subjects, Jehoshaphat emphasized the consideration that every member of the human family receives from the God of justice who rules over all. God standeth in the congregation of the mighty. He judgeth among the gods. And those who are appointed to act as judges under him are to defend the poor and fatherless. They are to do justice to the afflicted and needy and rid them out of the hand of the wicked. Psalm 82, verses 1, 3, and 4. Prophets and Kings, page 198. Sometimes a man who has been placed in responsibility as a leader gains the idea that he is in a position of supreme authority and that all his brethren, before making advance moves, must first come to him for permission to do that which they feel should be done. Such a man is in a dangerous position. He has lost sight of the work of a true leader among God's people. Instead of acting as a wise counselor, he assumes the prerogatives of an exacting ruler. God is dishonored by every such display of authority and self-exaltation. No man standing in his own strength is ever to be mind and judgment for another man whom the Lord is using in his work. No one is to lay down man-made rules and regulations to govern arbitrarily his fellow laborers who have a living experience in the truth. God calls upon those who have exercised undue authority to take off from his workers every dominating hand. Let everyone to whom has been entrusted sacred responsibilities seek to understand his individual duty before God and do that duty humbly and faithfully. Let no one regard himself as a master with controlling power to exercise over his brethren. The principles of the word of God are to be taught and practiced. Testimonies to Ministers and Gospel Workers, pages 491 and 492. Wednesday, February 7. Pour out your indignation. The patience and long-suffering of God, which should soften and subdue the soul, has an altogether different influence upon the careless and sinful. It leads them to cast off restraint and strengthens them in resistance. They think that God, who has borne so much from them, will not heed their perversity. If we lived in a dispensation of immediate retribution, offenses against God would not occur so often. But though delayed, the punishment is nonetheless certain. There are limits even to the forbearance of God. The boundary of his long suffering may be reached, and then he will surely punish. And when he does take up the case of the presumptuous sinner, he will not cease till he has made a full end. Very few realize the sinfulness of sin. They flatter themselves that God is too good to punish the offender. But the cases of Miriam, Aaron, David, 
and many others show that it is not a safe thing to sin against God in deed, in word, or even in thought. God is a being of infinite love and compassion, but he also declares himself to be a consuming fire, even a jealous God. Ellen G. White comments in the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 3, page 1166. As the bow in the cloud is formed by the union of the sunlight and the shower, so the rainbow encircling the throne represents the combined power of mercy and justice. It is not justice alone that is to be maintained, for this would eclipse the glory of the rainbow of promise above the throne. Men could see only the penalty of the law. Were there no justice, no penalty, there would be no stability to the government of God. It is the mingling of judgment and mercy that makes salvation complete. Mercy invites us to enter through the gates into the city of God, and justice is satisfied to accord to every obedient soul full privileges as a member of the royal family, a child of the heavenly king. If we were defective in character, we could not pass the gates that mercy has opened to the obedient, for justice stands at the entrance and demands holiness in all who would see God. Maranatha, page 326. Were justice extinct, and were it possible for divine mercy to open the gates to the whole race, irrespective of character, there would be a worse condition of disaffection and rebellion in heaven than before Satan was expelled. The peace, happiness, and harmony of heaven would be broken. The change from earth to heaven will not change men's character. The happiness of the redeemed in heaven results from the character formed in this life after the image of Christ. The saints in heaven will first have been saints on earth. The law of God is not weakened by the gospel, but the power of sin is broken and the scepter of mercy is extended to the penitent sinner. God will never forget his people in their struggle against evil. The Review and Herald, December 13, 1892. Thursday, February 8. The Lord's Judgment and the Sanctuary The sanctuary was designed to impress the Israelites with the holiness of God and his abhorrence of sin, and further to show them that they could not come in contact with sin without becoming polluted. Every man was required to afflict his soul while this work of atonement was going forward. All business was to be laid aside, and the whole congregation of Israel were to spend the day in solemn humiliation before God with prayer, fasting, and deep searching of heart. On the Day of Atonement, the high priest, having taken an offering from the congregation, went into the most holy place with the blood of this offering and sprinkled it upon the mercy seat directly over the law to make satisfaction for its claims. Then, in his character of mediator, he took the sins upon himself and bore them from the sanctuary. Placing his hands upon the head of the scapegoat, he confessed over him all these sins, thus in figure transferring them from himself to the goat. The goat then bore them away, and they were regarded as forever separated from the people. The Great Controversy, pages 419 and 420. Since Satan is the originator of sin, the direct instigator of all the sins that caused the death of the Son of God, justice demands that Satan shall suffer the final punishment. Christ's work for the redemption of men and the purification of the universe from sin will be closed by the removal of sin from the heavenly sanctuary and the placing of these sins upon Satan, who will bear the final penalty. So in the typical service, the yearly round of ministration closed with the purification of the sanctuary and the confessing of the sins on the head of the scapegoat. Thus, in the ministration of the tabernacle and of the temple that afterward took its place, the people were taught each day the great truths relative to Christ's death and ministration, and once each year their minds were carried forward to the closing events of the great controversy between Christ and Satan, the final purification of the universe from sin and sinners. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 358. Today Jesus is standing at the altar of mercy, presenting before God the prayers of those who desire his help. He turns no weeping contrite one away. 
freely will he pardon all who come to him for forgiveness and restoration. He does not tell to any all that he might reveal, but he bids every trembling soul take courage. Whosoever will may take hold of God's strength and make peace with him, and he will make peace. The souls that turn to him for refuge, Jesus lifts above the accusing and the strife of tongues. No man or evil angel can impeach these souls. Christ unites them to his own divine human nature. They stand beside the great sin-bearer in the light proceeding from the throne of God. The Ministry of Healing, page 90. For further reading, This Day with God, God's Law is Immutable, page 246, and In Heavenly Places, Our Personal Intercessor, page 79.